when we start to get at this question of what is communication and how is communication related to self-other problems, self-other relations, this might be, a, I guess, a, an interesting way to come at it. Now, when I say that communication is a problematic term, I think there are three embedded terms or three kinds of concepts that come in that when a person uses the word communication, you're not sure which of the three they're referring to. And because of that, it, it makes for, I guess, just slippery wheels at, at certain places. But it's the more that people could get at what are those three, I think the more that we can get clear on what is a self, how does self relate to society, and, you know, is society simply an abstraction? I mean, are an individual the only thing that's real? To what extent is society real? To what extent does society precede the individual? You know, to what extent is, I guess, the collective mind, the reality, and the individual mind an abstraction from that? And to what extent is the individual mind real and the collective mind a kind of an abstraction out of that? I mean, there's different ways to come at it. But the three concepts that are embedded within the notion of, of communication, for my sense here, are speech, language, and discourse. So if I say speech, language, and discourse, all of them, I guess they're related to this concept of communication, that when we communicate, we're potentially engaged in some form of speech, some form of language, and some form of discourse. And I think one way to cut at it is to say that speech refers to the organismal gesticulations and the possibilities of meaning within a body whose capacities for meaning and significance are partly in sound and in making sound and in uh, being able to, I guess, animate things in, in a certain way, to, to use the body in a way that makes sound with meaning and significance. And I think you could say that the phenomenologists and the phonologists and the uh, people who do speech pathology, these are probably the people who have the best command over the issues and problems related to speech. When you move to language, language is something much more complicated than that. Not only is there spoken language and written language and we get into the problem of writing and literacy, but you get into all kinds of problems of grammar and syntax and different languages and the evolution of language and the way that languages are they're a remnant of others of a third party that slide between the two people who are speaking. So as two people are speaking to one another, if they're using language, assuming that they're using language, the language that they're using is like an unseen other that slides between. And it's a archaeological and historical record of past meanings and significations and the, the language itself, it has, I guess, objective properties that are independent of the speaker. That is, the speaker, as the speaker speaks, the speech is part of the embodied act. It actually has production that's, that's part of the embodied utterance, or part of the embodied motion, the embodied, embodied movement. But language as you move toward writing or as you move toward an abstract system that has certain kinds of relations and we'll say um, kinds of syntax that are more than the, the accumulation of any particular set of utterances, that somehow there are rules that develop up that can be applied to an original case and it's not just a repetition of something that you've already heard. And now when you get to something like transformational grammar, when you move to there, you start to get to this fuzzy line of is this language, is this speech, 
And again, some of it gets very fuzzy. Uh, when you move to discourse, though, see, discourse is that third term. Discourse seems to be socio-historical. It seems to be uniquely, uh, or, or not uniquely, perhaps uh, most well understood by anthropologists, historians, people who are aware of the cultural bearing of language and speech, the way that distance and the way that time and I guess the sort of overarching sensibilities that give shape and form to language practices and speech practices, you know, th those they evince a kind of sociality at a different level. And so I guess what I'm trying to get at is the question of how does the individual relate to the social is, is very complicated. We could say, well, individuals relate to society in that, you know, people communicate. Well, okay, they communicate, but they communicate through speech, language, and through discourse. And there are different levels at which sociality is, I guess, inscribed there. That is, you can in some way speak, even though you don't speak someone's language, when you're traveling in a foreign country. There are sounds that you can make that can be animated, that the person can know you are in distress. You can point and you can make organismal sounds that, you know, I guess you could get, you know, a foreign dog to understand. I mean, if you want to force the issue about what speech is, I mean, your, your dog potentially has the capacity to speak in some regard discourse or language, you know, th those, they're going to be a lot more abstract in the kind of sociality that's implied. There's a sociality of historicity, of unseen others, of those kinds of others who enabled me to become myself. See, part of the problem is that when we learn to speak to others, we accumulate a language that allows us to use language to speak to ourselves. And as we're speaking to ourselves, we're using that within these larger cultural discursive forms which have assumptions and sensibilities and prejudices and biases about what makes for a good person, what makes for a meaningful life, what is a reasonable amount of responsibility to assume for oneself what are, what is uh, I guess the the kinds of what are the kinds of obligations one has to one's neighbor what doesn't all these kinds of things they provide again a kind of discursive backdrop for speech practices and language practices but I guess the the, the larger point, again, is maybe forcing the issue of, of ambiguity or complexity, that when we say that people are social, I think the kind of sociality is, it's more than simply individuals in a collective somehow form society. That's not really right. I mean, not only can people be lonely in a crowd and so have some form of self-relation that is a kind of sociality in its own right. See, I think part of the problem is that when we think of others, oftentimes people think of others as those bodies that are over there that are an occasional feature of one's experience. So you're walking along and then another comes over to you and they talk with you and you have an interaction with that person and because you understood the language that they used you say okay I just had an encounter with the other but the other is actually a condition of one's existence they're not just a feature of experience again it's a condition of existence and to that extent my own self-awareness is dependent upon unseen others that we call history or society or culture or maybe even you know those intimate now dead others who are part of one's own self-awareness one's own sensibilities in the world and you know there are I guess d different ways of understanding sociality where you don't get into I think a very simplistic problem of thinking that the society 
is real and the individuals are abstractions or the individuals are real and then the so society are abstractions. I think both of those are problematic ways of understanding it. There seem to be self-other relations as conditions of existence at multiple levels and you can shake it out when you see things like the way that the word communication just slides ambiguously between and through those terms of speech language and uh, and discourse okay thanks